Thanks for coming. Um, there's a lot of good stuff this morning, so appreciate everyone being here. Um, so why I'm going to talk about this, and uh, I'm going to start by just going into why a little bit of um, why I got into this project. It's I've been doing I've been started this uh, project uh, in the last year. It was something that I was supposed to do during COVID, and uh, and then it got delayed. So most of what I know about mountain cartography, about ways to represent terrain and mountains on maps, I've learned from people that are in the photo here. They're overwhelmingly Westerners. Um, they're from Europe, North America, a couple of people from New Zealand. And so I wanted to um, kind of broaden what I, uh, what I knew about uh, mountain cartography by looking at some non-Western kind of approaches. So I, I decided to focus on Japan for a number of reasons. Um, there's a long quote here that you can read while I'm, while I'm talking about the kind of the idea of the cultural significance of mountains to a lot of people, just by uh, being a part of, uh, by growing up in, in Japan. It's a very mountainous country, and the mountains are often kind of important to uh, uh, culturally. Um, Japan has a long history of cartography by Japanese uh, by Japanese cartographers. It was brought over probably in the uh, sixth century um, with Buddhism and the Chinese influence. And then it's developed um, over the last you know, 1,400 years. Um, and so I was interested in that long kind of tradition. Um, Japan was also isolated from the West for almost 250 years um, between the 1630s and uh, 1853. Uh, this is a period called Sakoku. The, there were a series of national policies that restricted the exchange of, uh, of ideas and, and uh, material goods with Western countries. And this um, began in the 1600s and then kind of came to an abrupt end in about 1853 when um, Perry steamed into uh, to the bay by Tokyo with the black ships and kind of demanded that the country open up to trade with the West. And so during this period of, um, of, uh, of Sokoku, when Japan was kind of isolated, um, there were a lot of innovations in mountain cartography that occurred in Europe. So this is the time when European cartographers were transitioning from pictorial representations of mountains to these other you know, more abstract techniques like hachure uh, marks, contour lines, slope shading and shaded relief. So part of my motivation here was to kind of try to understand, one, what kind of Japanese methods of terrain representation developed in isolation of Western cartography, um, but then also to, to document when Japanese cartographers um, began to integrate these Western methods of, of terrain representation into their maps and kind of look for the Sokoku effect, if there was a delay um, in, in, their, in the adoption of these methods in maps that were made um, by, by Japanese. So why focus on Hokkaido? Um, part of this, if you're, you know, if you're gonna eat an elephant, you might as well start with the trunk. And so I started at the northern end, um, but also because it, during, uh, during this Sokoku period, in the, in the beginning of it at least, in, until about the 19th century, um, Hokkaido was a part of Izo, which was a kind of a borderland frontier. So this is a map of, of Japan from 1779 that does not include um, Hokkaido. It, it, it should be um, off, the, off the end of the island. And so um, at the time, it was inhabited by the indigenous Ainu um, people who uh, were relied on fishing and hunting and kind of moved, moved a fair amount around, um, around the country or around the territory. Um, and then it was annexed by Japan in the, in the 19th century. And so you start seeing this, this ho like the sunfish of, of Hokkaido kind of popping up on maps as the, the kind of the, the late addition to the country. So I was, the additional goal with focusing on Hokkaido is to kind of situate the history of mountain cartography within the historical colonization and modern development of the island and to, to see how the maps were kind of participated in, in this uh, event. So then I want to, the, the approach is to more or less kind of look at, look at maps and look at the techniques that they're using to represent terrain. So I want to talk about some of the design patterns. And I'm going to go about it kind of like this. The red line kind of divides the Sokoku above it from the after the black ships below it. 
And then I'm going to go through for these years focusing on these cartographers and, and examples of, um, of, of a map or, um, that they, they produced and look at the design patterns in them. So I'm actually going to start a little bit in the middle of, the, of this. I'm not going to go strictly chrono chronological in the, in the presentation here because the Inyo Tadataka and the Mamiya map is a, is a pretty f famous one and pretty influential. Um, so I'm going to start with that one. Um, this is a quick picture of it. Um, it was uh, Inyo Tadataka is famous in Japan for having kind of walked and surveyed the entire coastline. And um, he created the first really accurate um, measured survey of the, of the entire archipelago. He actually never finished his survey of Hokkaido. Hokkaido was the first place he went to, and he walked along the kind of the southern shore of it, but he never went back and, and finished it. So it was finished up by Mamiya. And, uh, and then the map that was uh, resulted from this came out in, um, in the 1820s. And so some of the patterns, one of the really distinctive thing of this maps is the, the mountains wind up kind of encircling the shoreline. You always get a view of the mountains kind of from the shore looking in. And as the shoreline kind of changes and moves, the orientation of the mountains um, change with it. Um, this, of course, is a, is a time where the Japanese were not hanging maps on walls. They were looking at maps on the mat and, and kind of sitting around it. And so in a way, this kind of um, perspective uh, that they're uh, using for, um, for mountains is kind of inviting for everyone sitting around the room and everyone gets the view of the, of the, of the island as you would um, by sitting around it. Um, there's also a tendency to kind of distinguish some mountains as distinct from others. And they do this in a, th this map does this in a couple of ways. It, it uses kind of more detail and to kind of show some of the individual traits of the peaks and also kind of different um, colors. It breaks from the green um, the hue that shows most of the mountains to show the, um, the peaks as, uh, as something different. The orientation is also kind of interesting when you follow roads, when, they, when the, the map moves away from the coast and follows a road that cuts over a mountain pass because the, the orientation of the mountains kind of shifts depend, based on if when you're going up, upslope versus when you cross downslope. So again, it's kind of geared towards the, the, the underlying terrain um, and kind of shifting with the perspective you, that you might have as you move across the landscape. Um, and the map is kind of evoking the kind of the experience of someone who's kind of traveling through with a high level of aesthetics. Um, and then it also kind of, one of the things that's really interesting about this map is how much white space it leaves. There's a tendency to kind of leave um, places that were not surveyed and would, did not serve as landmarks for the survey just as empty, empty space. Um, and there are some ex uh, uh, exceptions to this. So this is where the Matsumai clan kind of had a, had a kind of early foothold of the island during, during the Sokoku period. And so there's a little bit more of a kind of an intrusion inward here um, where there's, uh, there's a bit more time uh, uh, and access spent in this, in this place. So then I'm going to sh shift here and see, uh, just keep going. Um, I'm going to move to... Ooh, it didn't get highlighted. Uh, okay, so sorry. It's to, to Taka's original survey, um, and uh, just to kind of again show some of these um, patterns. So this is um, from Hakodat, kind of moving um, across the island. I've shifted it here. So this is what you're looking at. There's a large mountain here, and he's moving across the um, the inland valley there. Um, and there's again this kind of topographic strip horizon. So the orientation of the mountains kind of as you look on one side of the road, you're facing the mountains. And then if you turned and looked at the other side of the roads, the mountains are drawn as they're, as they're facing you. Um, there's also this tendency to kind of distinguish some um, peaks um, with hue and detail. This little crag on it is something that you see when you, when you visit the island. And so they're given more kind of individual distinction than a lot of the more uniform strip. Um, these same patterns kind of appear in uh, this map from 1802. Um, so this was uh, an envoy for the shogun kind of trying to map the territory um, before the annexation. And again, you have these mountains that the orientation shifts with the coastline. Um, and you have details that distinguish the individual peaks 
And again, here you even on the river, you have something that we saw with the road pattern of the mountains kind of being oriented to that feature. Um, they're also using hue, so I just have this. The, uh, the Yodel Mountain here is a, is a blue tint to kind of distinguish it as something kind of distinct from the surrounding terrain. Uh, and then going up closer to the, to the, to the break and the, and the arrival of the black ships, the last one is from 1841, um, went up to the northern islands north of, of uh, at the very northern end of Hokkaido. Thanks. And... Uh, um, you again have the kind of the portrait of a mountain with detail um, and it's it's interesting like this actually isn't smoke coming off it's a it's a canyon and so that kind of it, it shifts the orientation along the coast and the and the trouble of actually representing this kind of topographic feature as you would see it from the coastline up given this other um, feature that's shown from the other direction um, this is the other little island in in this map again showing the kind of the topographic strip of the horizon that encircles the island. So the kind of recurring patterns that are, that are seen over and over again. And then there's the arrival of the black ships. And the first map I want to talk about is the 1860 map by uh, Takashiro Matsura, who was originally uh, visiting the island as a private citizen, but his knowledge of the island and the Ainu was so extensive that he wound up being employed by the by the shogun and, uh, and the government. And so this is his map, and it's the first, um, first use of hashurs that I've, I've come across so far. Um, and so it's, uh, it's, it's kind of a beautiful map, but it's the first one that really abstracts the mountains that I've come across and no longer shows the kind of the portrait views, uses hashurs, and it's also richly detailed in place names and Ainu place names. And so there's this, there's this interesting transition of, of abstract, a kind of less of a beautiful map that is from the perspective of a traveler and more of an abstract terrain that's focusing on documenting the Ainu knowledge of the landscape. Um, if we keep going into 1890, and so um, you start seeing the real strong American influence. I don't have a very good copy of this right now. The digital copies are only available when you're in person at the National Diet Library. So this is just a quick picture I took while I was there to, to kind of help remember it. Um, if you've ever looked at the USGS topo maps from, um, from the 19th century, uh, it has very similar influences of the kind of brown, brownish red contour lines and the water lines off of the, off of the shore. Um, and then you have shaded relief that comes in in the, in the 20s. So the, where I'm going um, right now is to focus a little bit more on this transition. And so just trying to understand a little bit about how, the, how long the China Japanese traditions kind of held on on these, on, these, on these maps. So this is a map from 1873 after the black ships. Um, that shows the Sapporo Road, and it has this kind of topographic strip with kind of incredible detail. It's a really beautiful map. Um, but basically, when you look on one side of the road, the mountains are going up, and then when you look at the other side of the road, the mountains are going up from the perspective of the road, if that makes sense. And there are some exceptions, sorry, where some of the foreground does not follow that flip. So it's interesting. Um, so the initial conclusions, again, I'm just, I'm, I'm, ba I'm barely a year into this um, project, um, but this is uh, where, uh, where I'm kind of landing. There does seem to be a Sakoku influence in that there, the pictorial um, traditions seem to last a bit longer um, than um, maybe the 19th century, but certainly persist. There's, there's a number of, of, I think, innovative or of traditional kind of Japanese um, techniques that are, that are seen here. And then you start getting the hashur contour and other kind of methods adopted a bit later than, than when you see them on the European maps. Um, the other side of this is the colonial influence. So I was interested that a lot of the Japanese maps kind of visually reinforce the ter territorial annexation of Izo, but kind of, they kind of make the maps look like Japan. And so in a way they kind of help kind of reinforce the annexation of it. They also highlight the aesthetics and the experience of kind of traveling through the landscape rather than kind of residing there. Um, 
the other maps, particularly this, this series, kind of document the indigenous presence on the island and the geographic knowledge that's being lost in a way. I think it's interesting that the, the mountains are becoming more abstracted here, but the kind of the indigenous knowledge is getting more brought to the foreground. And then the last is the American influence coincides with the use of maps to really plan the colonization and development of the islands. So these, um, these uh, uh, cadasters that are showing these kind of uh, very rational geometric lines that are being drawn on this map are visible in the landscape today. If you look at Google um, imagery of, uh, of the island, these are all now windbreaks and tree lines that are direct descendants of the lines that were drawn on these American-influenced uh, 19th century maps. So the acknowledgments, thanks to the Marion Jasper Whiting Foundation got me over there. Middlebury College has um, helped support a uh, trip. Emma Brown did some of the initial work on uh, while uh, during the COVID shutdown on the background of the, of the, the his history. Um, many really nice librarians kind of worked with me as I um, asked to get access to the maps, and then these are the collections that I used. So, uh, thanks. So in some places I may cut off. Can you repeat the question actually for the recording? I think so the question was about what are some of the lines that are um, showing up along the coastline that go out into the water? Is that more or less? Yeah. yeah. And so often there might be an island out there that I've either cropped out or ha and um, from the image that I showed, um, and they're taking bearings to those. The um, Tadataka's technique was to, he didn't drag a chain or, or measuring rope, he counted his paces but he did a lot of um, measurements uh, on the direction and the azimuths of, of landmarks. Um, he was trained as a kind of as an astronomer uh, before he went out. Um, so a lot of that is just showing that it's, it, it's kind of comes from direct measurement and observation and documenting that in addition to the kind of aesthetics of it. Thank you. Uh, so I think we're gonna move on to our next speaker. So thank you. You yeah. bet, thank you.